Hi everyone. We have a special treat for you guys today. We're here with Dana Boyd, the author of It's Complicated, The Social Lives of Network Teens. Dana Boyd, thank you very much for speaking with me. My first question for you is, how did you become interested in understanding teenagers' social media use, and why was this the right time to write a book about it? Yeah. Um, I actually was a part of the first generation of teenagers who grew up online. Uh, and for me, the internet was the saving grace. Uh, I grew up in the middle of Pennsylvania. I didn't feel like I belonged. Uh, and my brother got a computer um, back in the days before the World Wide Web existed. And he would frustrate me because he would hook it up to the phone line and it would make these terrible screeching, beeping sounds. And one day I marched into his room and I'm like, what are you doing? Um, and he showed me that he was being a part of all of these amazing online communities. It was the days of Usenet, the days of bulletin boards, and he showed me that the internet was made of people. Um, and all of a sudden I was like, ooh, I like it. Uh, and so I went to, stud I went to uh, university to study computer science. I thought I would build these systems that I fell in love with. Uh, and then I retrained under a group of anthropologists. And I realized that I wanted to understand what people were doing with technology. Uh, and my advisor was given an opportunity to study teenagers. And he was like, are you interested? And I said, sure. I figured I would go back and I would see what had happened to technology, what had happened to youth culture, now that you know things had gone mainstream. And this was just conveniently timed. Um, I originally proposed the project to look at LiveJournal and Zanga uh, and the emergent blogging platforms, but then along came MySpace. And so I had the great fortune of watching the rise and fall of MySpace, the rise and now fall of Facebook, uh, the you know, proliferation of apps. And I wrote the book, uh, I mean, if I were honest, it got out as fast as I could get it out myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to pretend like it was well-timed intentionally. But I think part of the message of the book is that these anxieties and concerns about young people, they keep coming at us. We keep hearing them. Um, and so what I'm hoping with the book is that people can engage, can understand young people from their own perspectives, from you know what they're trying to do. And try to step back and, and appreciate the challenges, the opportunities, and be a little calmer. Um, you know, things are not always easy, but it's still, it's important to sort of get perspective. And I think in some ways with technology, we've lost perspective. Awesome, thank you very much for that. Um, my second question for you is, you know, I'm 20, 22, just actually 23, I'm sorry, 23. <laughs> so a lot of the people my age, uh, we all, I feel like we have this, this belief that uh, with this new thing called social media, we have so much power. You know, we can get someone to have 10 million YouTube views, we can make internet sensations, we can really launch people's career. Uh, I just want to get your perspective on this newfound power by youth. Mm -hmm. and. Is it real power or is it a false kind of sense of power? It's a good question. Um, um, I think it's challenging because in some ways, historically, there were a lot of intermediaries who decided which young people would get what opportunities. Um, you know, we recently lost Shirley Temple. And if you think about Shirley Temple Black, and if you think about her history in film, you know, she was identified and given tremendous opportunity to change American society um, during an era in which, you know, a young child on TV could really make a lot of people feel, you know, better about the world in light of the war. Um, today, it's this interesting challenge because young people have the ability to get access to tools where they can do phenomenal things. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they all do or that they're heard or listened to. So I'll give you an example from my field work, which is that um, I was in Los Angeles when a lot of the uh, battles around immigration were really brewing. And there were a lot of efforts to do protests um, in the mid-2000s um, by adults. And it usually involved Spanish-speaking radio, was doing all of this galvanizing. And so a lot of young people turned to this and said, hey, wait, we're not being heard. And many of these young people were themselves documented, born in the US, but their parents were undocumented. And they wanted to speak back and, and, and raise a lot of attention to the immigration issues. Um, and MySpace was really popular at the time. And so a lot of young people decided to galvanize their peers um, through social media, through, through MySpace. Um, and they did very effectively. They staged a protest um, where they got a lot of uh, high school students to walk out um, and to uh, question the policies that were that were underway. Um, 
And the response was universally damning. That these teenagers who engaged in this amazing act of activism that we would normally think of as so powerful were blasted by the media as not understanding the issues, as not, you know, it just was a, an excuse to skip school. Um, and Mayor Villaraigosa in Los Angeles came out and basically shamed all of these teenagers and said, um, you know, Cesar Chavez would be embarrassed by you. Like, how, how dare you? you? You have an opportunity to go to school, and what do you do? You throw it away by walking out. Um, and of course, what you learn is that in California, the mayor loses uh, money each day that students don't show up to school. So there's a lot of politics at play. But I think the reason I point this out as sort of a conflicted issue is that on one hand, young people did this amazingly empowering act, this very political act. And yet the response was not actually appreciating their opportunities, but telling them that they have to behave in this particular way. And this is where I think we've had a, you know, a challenge with teenagers is that they're not encouraged to speak out. They're not encouraged to be a part of public life. They're not encouraged to take ownership of their lives. They're very much told to play by the rules. And I think that that's an unfortunate, you know, aspect of this because there are such, you know, amazing tools out there that can be grabbed to do great things, but not if we keep telling young people that they shouldn't and couldn't. Wow, and I, I can, you know, I can definitely relate to that. I, I, I produce a youth media show and our show is all about youth voice. Um, my next question is, um, I was doing a high school media camp earlier this summer, I mean last summer, and uh, I forgot this because I haven't been in high school in a while, but they don't per they don't permit the students to be on Facebook and YouTube or any of those, of those uh, social media websites. Do you think that's wrong? So, you know, one of the one of my jokes is that you know we often use education as the excuse to get in the way of learning, um, which is to say that <laughs> you know there's so much learning that takes place when you interact with other people. Right? that you learn how to read people's facial expressions, how to be empathetic, um, how to appreciate where somebody comes from. You learn to express your ideas through the process of interaction. Um, you learn to understand how you fit into a broader world. Uh, and as we've you know, increasingly emphasized very formal, measurable ways of, of you know, formal mechanisms of, of education, we have lost track of all of this aspect of learning. Um, and so this is where I think social media comes into place in a really odd way, which is that for the last 30 years in American society, we have systematically restricted young people's access to opportunities to hang out with their friends. And we do it for a variety of justifications, right? It's a waste of time, you know, we're afraid of public spaces, et cetera, et cetera. Young people, meanwhile, are looking for any place to call their own, a place to just hang out, a place to be social. Even our schools or after school activities have very little amounts of time to just chill. You know, I'm, I'm amazed, you know, two and a half minutes, three minutes between bells. Um, you know, lunch, lunch times where in some schools are required to be silent. It's like, what, what is this? You know, we're silent all day. And so what's happened with technology is that it becomes this relief valve, this place where you know your friends are there, you know you can hang out. And so I'm not surprised that schools or you know, other, other programs and summer camps are telling young people to stay off of social media um, because it's seen as a distraction, as a problem, rather than seen as this uh, you know, amazing opportunity to connect. And so I think it's really unfortunate. Does that mean you know, connections have to be happening all the time? No, of course not. But how do you fit it in and balance it and, and respect why young people are coming to technology? Awesome, I like that. Um, now, I know you've, I, I've, 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 I've seen a lot of your interviews and I know you've addressed this topic, but I still want to ask you this question. Um, you know, as you know, cyberbullying is a huge issue in our society, um, especially in the LGBT youth community. Um, how can society use your research to respond or better prevent cyberbullying? Yeah. You know, so the first thing to keep in mind is that uh, bullying is one aspect of meanness and cruelty. And one of the things that I struggle with is that a lot of adults use the language of bullying to refer to every aspect of meanness and cruelty, from joking around and teasing amongst friends to serious forms of criminal harassment. 
What's been interesting about my research is that I found that, in an you know ironic way, uh, young people actually define bullying by and large like researchers, which is to say that it was psychological, physical, or social aggression repeated over time by people of differential physical or social power. It's the big kid picking on the little kid, the cool kid picking on the geek. Um, and so what ends up you know, challenging is that when adults use this whole range of things, they don't understand the dynamics of what happens online. Surprisingly, bullying hasn't been on the rise for the last 30 years. Um, it is far more visible online, um, but that visibility is complicated because not only do young people sort of have to ex be experiencing that in envi other environments, but they also have to, they also get tremendous amounts of support. People come to them and love them accordingly. And so you get this dynamic of how do you get support, how do you figure out the mess of it. In terms of how people can use it, I think it's really critical to really think about how the interventions are different across the spectrum of meanness and cruelty. Bullying requires not punitive measures, but social emotional learning measures. You know, uh, lightweight meanness, the things we see every day, require adults to step back and say, why is reality TV about meanness? Why is politics about meanness? How do we change our own practices? With LGBT youth, I think that it's, it's a particularly challenging issue because it requires addressing our you know, homophobic aspects of our society. And we can't fix you know, LGBT-related discrimination um, just on the backs of young people in school or online. We have to question why our politicians are using you know, discrimination as a justifiable way of acting. And, it, and that's why these things become systemic, systemic issues. And to, What's beautiful about the technology is that they re it reflects back what's going on. And so the, rather than being anxious about the technology itself, it's this crazy opportunity to look at the technology, appreciate what we see, and try to then think about holistic interventions. I like it. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think we're just out of time. Uh, I really appreciate you coming in and inter uh, doing an interview with me. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. This has been a podcast from the... Department of Communications at the University of Washington. I'm Austin Williams signing off. Thank you very much for everyone tuning in.